So it's 12 noon here on the East Coast, and we are thrilled to have so many of you with us. We're grateful for the time you are spending um, to hear from a group of uh, attorneys and specialists from two different organizations. Uh, one, Bon Shenigan King, uh, where I come from. I'm Gabe Oberfield. I know many of you through our uh, various webinars, including our uh, Tuesday webinar series. Uh, here, I'm you know, representing Bond as we uh, are going to be discussing the 1115 waiver. We're delighted to have a very uh, capable co-partner in the uh, mix for today's discussion. That's COPE Health Solutions. COPE, as you'll hear momentarily, has been deeply enmeshed in the work uh, that will be inherent in the uh, 1115 waiver uh, as it's implemented here in New York State. So um, without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about uh, housekeeping for today's webinar. Um, you will be hearing, um, and thank you to Kathy for advancing the slides, from a group of presenters over the course of the hour we have together. Uh, first, you'll be hearing from me. Um, I'll provide some background on the 1115 waiver and its predicates in New York State. Um, you'll also be hearing from Danielle Feldman, who's a senior consultant uh, with Cope Health Solutions. She'll be providing uh, background on lessons learned from California, which are numerous, and Danielle was very close to that implementation, as you'll learn more momentarily. So we're very glad to be hearing from Danielle. Uh, again, that will follow me. Um, thereafter, uh, after uh, Stephen Hefter uh, and I together introduce uh, this webinar uh, momentarily, uh, and Stephen, I should note, is a manager with COPE and also on the screen with um, Alan Miller, who is the principal and chief executive officer of COPE. Uh, again, after Danielle is done, we will be moving to a panel discussion that will involve Alan as well as two bond attorneys uh, who may be known to you. One, Raul Tabora, a member in our Albany office, and a second, Roger Bearden, uh, a senior counsel also in our Albany office. Uh, we think there'll be a lot to learn from uh, what will be uh, a chance to meld perspectives of you know, what has worked in New York State historically and what has not with uh, the understanding that Cope Health Solutions and Alan in specific brings uh, to this conversation, again, by having uh, invested as an organization in the work in California. So if you could advance to the next slide, please, Kathy, what I'm going to uh, do is make sure that my colleague, Stephen, has a moment to uh, introduce Cope Health Solutions more formally, but let me first introduce Stephen. Stephen is a manager with uh, Cope Health Solutions and has been uh, deeply enmeshed in consulting that involves hospitals, health systems, ambulatory networks, FQHCs. Um, prior to joining COPE, uh, Stephen worked with BDO. Um, he's an MPH and PMP and uh, has really uh, focused on all aspects of financial and operational performance, very relevant disciplines to what we're here to talk about today. So Stephen, please, I'd love to hear more about uh, COPE and I'm confident that the audience would as well. Thanks, Gabe, um, and thank you for uh, introducing us today. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Um, as Gabe mentioned, my name is Stephen Hefter. I'm a manager here on the Copel Solutions team uh, based in New York City. Um, I'll be brief. Before we jump into uh, the content of today's webinar, I um, wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our firm briefly. Um, Copel Solutions is a national tech-enabled services firm uh, focused on powering success for health plans and providers and risk arrangements. Um, we do have a comprehensive NCQA certified uh, population health management platform um, and our highly experienced team kind of brings an expertise, experience and tools um, to kind of focus on our mission, which is improving financial performance um, and quality outcomes for all uh, types of payers and providers across the healthcare landscape. Um, as Gabe mentioned before, too, our firm um, has deep experience with 1115 Medicaid waivers um, in multiple states, including New York and California, um, which we'll shed some light on later in the webinar. Um, we currently are one of the largest vendors uh, on the California Technical Assistance uh, TA marketplace. 
um, and are very, very excited about the opportunities that um, this waiver um, in New York presents for community organizations um, to really drive and create a more equitable and integrated delivery system. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, uh, Gabe. Thank you very much, Stephen. And if, Kathy, you'd advance to the next slide. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Bond, I'll tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, we're a full service law firm. Um, you'll be hearing today uh, from me, as well as from Raul and Roger. Um, we are many more than that. Uh, we number more than 300 attorneys and uh, we have offices primarily in New York State, but also in Massachusetts, Florida, New Jersey, um, Kansas, uh, among uh, you know the other places in which we're present. And um, why that is important is not only can we be supportive around uh, health delivery questions and implementation, which is something that our uh, specific practice group has been involved with for uh, quite a while, and you'll be hearing more in the panel about the ways that um, our experience you know, may directly uh, be relevant to your navigation efforts uh, around the Medicaid 1115 waiver here in New York. Um, but we also have a deep passion and commitment um, through the clients we represent and otherwise um, how our you know, firm is constructed to make sure that uh, the kind of work that's contemplated by this waiver, as uh, Stephen was alluding to, you know, focused on equity and uh, healthcare expansion, uh, is ultimately implemented. It's something that you know, I think I can speak uh, comfortably uh, in sharing. You know, my colleagues, Roger, um, Raul, and I all share that passion and uh, bring it to our work. So if we can go to the next slide, please, I'll just uh, take a moment to walk through everybody what this waiver is, because um, if you have signed up for this, presumably you have some knowledge and some background, but it would be uh, perhaps helpful just to get a refresher. So I'll provide you with that grounding so we know how we arrive at this moment. Next slide, please, Kathy. So just for background and, and so you are further aware, um, many of these slides forthcoming um, are from the Department of Health, the New York State Department of Health or other um, publicly available um, websites. So I just want to make sure that uh, all of you are familiar with that if you wish to read up some more. Um, but I remind you that this is not the first time New York State has been involved with an 1115 Medicaid waiver or relating activities. Um, it's essentially, um, in many respects, um, a renewal of uh, the efforts that loosely were called uh, 1115. Um, there was a predecessor effort um, back in 2015 through 2020, roughly stated, uh, depending on you know, how you measure the clock starting and concluding, where New York State was uh, charged with, through partnership with the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to flow through what at the time you know, was about $8 billion with a B um, to distribute money around, um, among other things, uh, DISRIP, which is the Delivery System Performance Center um, Incentive Payment Program, and then also a significant amount of money uh, set aside for workforce and other um, relating activities to tally to that um, 8 billion I mentioned. Next slide, please. Over a five year run, there was a variety uh, of activities, there were a variety of activities taken uh, place all across New York State. Um, we at Bond were you know, certainly a part of that. Um, and you know there were efforts uh, in every geography uh, essentially to uh, try to, at its core, and if we're talking about the DISRIP uh, work specifically, which was the largest uh, component of the waiver, um, what we um, in New York State were trying to do was drive down uh, avoidable hospital use. And there were a number of different uh, sub tools and other foci to get there around uh, preventable emergency room visits, rental readmissions, et cetera. Um, all of the content here on this and other slides, by the way, will be available after we conclude. Uh, you'll also get a recording. So don't feel like you have to jot down notes very carefully here. You'll have this all afterward. Next slide, please. So it's not advancing on my screen, but I can tell you a little bit about um, you know, what it is that uh, comes next. So oh, there we go. Thank you very much. 
Um, here we are in New York um, at the beginning of this calendar year, 2024. Um, we learned at that time that there would be about $7.5 billion um, invested through a combination of about $6 billion New York state money, and then the balance from, uh, excuse me, $6 billion uh, federal, let me get that right, oh, forgive me, um, and then uh, the balance of New York state um, to drive through again, reforms through our Medicaid delivery system. But unlike DISRIP, which had that focus on hospitals and readmission, uh, the work here in New York State presently is intended to be geared around health equity, as Stephen alluded to a moment ago. Next slide, please. So let's get into the details as to you know, what that will entail. Um, we know that, uh, as I mentioned, six billion of this uh, is federal. And uh, there are these structures that uh, together are intended to advance health equity, reduce health disparities, and support the delivery of social care that has a very specific set of tenets and uh, characteristics that you'll learn about momentarily um, with overall goals around, uh, again, building those networks, strengthening the workforce, and addressing population health in a really hands-on and holistic fashion. Next slide, please. So what is important for you to recognize as uh, audience members is that health-related social needs, which is what HRSN stands for, um, are really the core focus of this waiver. Um, really looking at ways to bring attention to the upstream aspects that affect an individual's latter health outcomes by really driving through points of connection to the uh, interactions an individual has in the community that, um, if left unaddressed, um, can be deleterious. And so um, that's the ecosystem that um, is encapsulated in this circular image to the left of the slide. Again, more detail um, as you wish um, offline as well through the latter discussion. Next slide, please. So there are nine social care networks regionally positioned across New York State. These social care networks are serving in many respects as the hubs for regional, as one would expect, activity relating to the implementation of the social care, um, knowing that for, in many respects, excuse me, this has never been done, certainly in New York State, and what we will hear about is that in other states like California, there are useful ways to um, have uh, understanding of you know, what it looks like a few years in, because California is a bit further down the road than we are here in New York. Um, but you know, in each of these regions, there will be through these SCNs, an effort to essentially quarterback what it is to make um, social care um, drive forward in ways that connect with individuals and that upstream focus I was alluding to a moment ago. Next slide, please. So uh, here's some more detail on what the SCNs will be doing, um, among other things, organizing CBOs, uh, community-based organizations. We expect many of you on this call or rep webinar, excuse me, are representing CBOs. Um, there's going to be data sharing, and there are a wide array of other elements that we can get into um, later as we discuss some of what it is to breathe life into this. Next slide, please. And so uh, this is another slide the Department of Health has offered around uh, essentially how individuals will access um, these new services. They'll first be screened, and it'll be um, either that, yes, they qualify for services through the waiver, um, and then they will progress downward through uh, from left to right, as described here on the slide. And if for any reason um, they are not, by way of the screening, uh, qualified for specific waiver services, there will be um, opportunities for them to get other services through existing infrastructure in New York State. More on that in a moment. Next slide, please. And so um, if you are going to be uh, eligible for um, health-related social need type services in New York State, uh, there are specific criteria that are listed out here in bulleted form. 
Um, and you know, these are the various types of populations that are the target of this waiver. There were lots of discussions going back many years of between New York State and CMS as to what the core cohort of this waiver activity would look like. And again, that list that you see bulleted on the right side of the slide is by and large where the focus lies. And so that's the nature of opportunity we're here to discuss today. Next slide, please. And the funds will flow, um, if you look on the left side, in a top-down way from the Medicaid program through managed care organizations that are going to be receiving funds that's consistent with the way that, um, you know, going back to the Medicaid, the Medicaid excuse me, redesign team um, of the Andrew Cuomo administration, New York State has been flowing through the majority of uh, funds that relate to the Medicaid program. Um, those MCOs will then be in contract with the SCNs. The SCNs then will connect up with the service providers. That's those CBOs and others that um, we'll learn more about momentarily. Next slide, please. So that is the background that we hope gives you some basis as to how we got here and what's ahead. I know it was brief. Um, we want to make sure that we leave as much time for the discussion as we can, which is where we think the, you know, the best part of today's uh, dialogue will be, notwithstanding what you're about to hear, which is wonderful on the ground experience uh, that uh, Danielle Feldman, who's a senior consultant with Cope Health Solutions, uh, was able to acquire because Danielle, uh, before joining Cope, was employed by public consulting group, PCG, commonly known, um, and served as the project manager for the technical assistance marketplace in California. Basically, the way to help those community-based organizations figure out how to get into um, the waiver matrix, uh, because California, as I alluded, was a predecessor state to New York in receiving monies for this kind of purpose. Um, and so in that role, uh, it was Danielle's responsibility to uh, increased recipient participation, stakeholder engagement was also part of her uh, responsibility, and she established workflow pro processes, among other elements that she will allude to. And so with that, you know, very on the ground understanding of what worked and what didn't in California, Danielle, we're delighted to have you here. And please uh, go ahead and walk us through what it is that New York might learn from the California experience. Great. Thank you so much, Gabe. I'm delighted to be here. Once again, my name is Danielle Feldman. I'm with Cope Health Solutions. I'll be taking you through today a brief Medi-Cal overview and then some lessons for New York. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are not familiar, Medi-Cal is what the state of California refers to as their state Medicaid program. And here we have many initiatives that are under the Medi-Cal transformation waiver highlighting two specifically community supports and enhanced care management. As Gabe alluded to, um, my previous role was to work directly with DHCS, the state of California, to help design and Im implement the technical assistance marketplace in California. And I've since joined Cope Health Solutions uh, working on both New York and California clients. So if we go to the next slide, I'd like to call out that Cope Health Solutions is one of the largest and leading vendors on California's technical assistance marketplace, approved across all seven domains, which not every vendor is, to be able to deliver these services. So some of the lessons learned from Medi-Cal, as we've mentioned, these two initiatives have extensive overlapping areas of focus. So um, some Medi-Cal wins and shortfalls are listed below to create some successful insight for the state of New York. We have categorized them into four buckets. So first we have data access and sharing, then we have cross-plan collaboration and standardization, member engagement and retention. This one's specifically important, really an opportunity here to engage and screen members in the community at point of care, not just telephonically or via email, boots on the ground, feet on the street, as we all know, is very critical to improving enrollment rates. And then lastly, we have provider and CBO engagement and alignment. And our uh, panelists will take us through some more lessons learned in California during the discussion in just a moment. We can go to the next slide. So I have mentioned the Path Technical Assistance Marketplace a few times, but just what is the TA Marketplace? So providing access and transforming health, commonly known as PATH, is a $1.85 billion initiative in California approved under the 1115 waiver. This provides funding to county entities, providers, community-based organizations, other local entities such as Medi-Cal tribal designees and many others to expand capacity to implement Medi-Cal transfer 
transformation components, including enhanced care management and community supports being the main two. So um, the way the state of California has set this up is that there is state approved vendors who help directly uh, providers build out and reconfigure both their ECM and community supports programs. The technical assistance marketplace opened up for recipients in February 2023. So as Gabe said, they're a little bit ahead um, of New York on this. And as of right now, it is set and predicted to run through 2026. And once again, Cope Health Solutions is a vendor on the marketplace, providing a whole range of services, which we'll get into a little more in the next slides. Next slide, please. So what we have done is categorized um, our, the main kind of initiatives that we're seeing at CPO's request, the main projects, the main areas of need into seven domains. So the first three here are building data capacity, health-related social needs, HRSN, services, capacity building, and then contracting and financial services. So this could include staffing, financial models, all of that. And if we go to the next slide, I'll take you through the next four. These slides will be distributed after um, the meeting here, so that way we can read the individual projects more closely. So the last four domains would be case management, so any care plan development, care management, promoting health equity, supporting cross-sector partnerships, and lastly, a really important one is workforce. So um, the PATH uh, TA Marketplace helps provide CBOs and other social service providers improve their internal operations, enhance care delivery practices, and really importantly, improve patient outcomes and increase direct revenue for services rendered, which we're going to do here in New York as well. So this is kind of the overall seven categories we would say are the most high need, taking those lessons learned from California, the most popular projects that have been requested, the most po uh, popular needs of improvement. We can go to the next slide. So as Gabe mentioned, uh, the New York State 1115 waiver amendment includes $500 million for the HRSN infrastructure investment. So we have bucketed these into four categories here of technology, uh, development of business and operational practices, workforce development, and then lastly, outreach, education, and stakeholder competing. So these are, oh, there's a bunch of different um, examples listed here, but um, one really important call out is that Unlike the PATH Technical Assistant Marketplace in California, where CBOs and providers can easily apply for this funding and support through kind of a centralized program, um, here in New York, those infrastructure dollars are going to be really left up to the SENs and how they would like to distribute that money and those funds to CBOs. So here at Cope Health Solutions, we identified this gap of how can we really streamline this process and make it really easy for both CBOs and the SEN. So we have created the CBO Capacity and Infrastructure Funding Tool. There's a small snippet below. And um, here it will really assess CBO readiness, compare ro ROI for potential capacity building investments, and then most importantly, help the SCNs distribute and track the use of the funds. So it's a really nice and streamlined process here when using the tool. Um, in terms of what's in it for the CBOs, it's a great assessment, a really easy to use tool that will allow you to input your um, information, what's needed. So we can kind of identify those gaps and see where do you need help? Which seven of those seven domains that we listed could um, your organization improve on and help you further build your infrastructure with this uh, money that's coming out from New York State for HRSN infrastructure investment? We're really thrilled um, to have our firm's experience of being the le leading vendor in California and on this very similar initiative, and also our experience of being in the New York market for the past 15 years. And we know this is a really exciting time for both uh, CBOs and SENs. And though we know it could be overwhelming, we know there's a lot of excitement and we're very thrilled to be able to provide the solution for that with our tool. I will pass it back over to Gabe if there's anything that you would like to add before we continue to advance with the slides. Thank you very much, Danielle. I am really appreciative of this uh, background on California. And let me ask you, Kathy, please, to advance to our next slide because I'll use that as the opportunity to introduce our panel. Um, and we have three distinguished panel presenters with us today. Um, the first, um, you got a brief introduction to earlier, um, that's Alan Miller, who's the Principal and Chief Executive Officer of Cope Health Solutions. Alan is with us from uh, the New York City office of Cope Health Solutions, and we are delighted uh, that he uh, can join. Uh, for more than 30 years, um, Alan has led the planning, implementation, optimization 
of clinically integrated networks, um, independent uh, practice associations, um, accountable care organizations. There are uh, lots of ways in which those kinds of structures are relevant uh, to what we're discussing here. But as Alan uh, mentioned in remarks uh, as we were uh, preparing to go live, one of the things that Cope Health Solutions does and that Alan has committed uh, to over many years in his career is uh, very deep and thorough technical assistance work. And so uh, that is another uh, big part of what I expect Alan will be uh, addressing in the context of you know, what has been, um, again, learned in California that will be applicable here in New York. Um, also on the screen, you see Roger Bearden. Roger Bearden is uh, one of two bond attorneys who will be with us. Roger is a human services attorney with over two decades of experience in the public and private sectors. Um, prior to joining Bond as senior counsel, Roger served in multiple senior leadership positions in New York state government, including as executive deputy uh, commissioner at um, the, and the general counsel for the New York state office of people with developmental disabilities. Um, and uh, prior to that, uh, it was uh, the case that Roger worked throughout leadership in the uh, Andrew Cuomo administration, uh, managing uh, the health and human services portfolio. Uh, and so we are uh, delighted to have that experience with us at Bond. Certainly, um, it'll be useful to hear um, how what Roger was involved with in implementing DISRIP and related activity may well uh, be applicable here in this new form. And Rod, and I'm sorry, uh, Roger is one of two attorneys with us from our Albany office. Um, Raul Tabora is the other. Uh, and uh, Raul, though, uh, is in many respects the anchor of our health um, and long-term care practice. Uh, he indeed co-leads it, and he's had a career immersed in healthcare law, um, working uh, in his first stint uh, within government, uh, and then moved into private practice, um, where he has spent the you know, vast majority of his career thereafter managing uh, complex clients uh, relating to healthcare entities wish to lead or otherwise to enhance their positions um, within uh, the marketplace. Much of that has involved looking at complex dynamics around programs such as DISRIP. Um, and Raul is also uh, one of the attorneys who first got to know health IT in New York and has been a leader in providing guidance uh, through a legal lens for many years for um, organizations seeking out Raul uh, for that basis of knowledge. And so here at Bond, uh, we bring uh, legal and regulatory experience generally to these uh, kinds of questions. And that is why it'll be really useful to have both Raul's experience uh, and Rogers uh, as part of this discussion with Alan. Um, what I also wanted to note, and it seems that one person has already figured it out, um, we have um, a chat function available in this webinar. It's actually an icon that will be labeled for all of you as Q and A with a question mark. You can enter any question that you may have there. We will do our best to answer those questions in real time. Know, however, that we probably will be unable to get to every question posed just uh, based on the nature of limited time for discussion that we have right now. Um, but we will, in uh, best efforts, get answers to everyone who raises a question our goal is to issue a frequently asked questions document that follows this, so look for that as well. And we're grateful that several audience members post questions ahead of the webinar during the registration process, so we'll also do our best to attend to those as well as some others that we thought would be worthy of this discussion. Um, I will be co-moderating this discussion along with Stephen, who's sitting next to Alan. And as I had mentioned earlier, Stephen is also based in the New York City um, office of Cope Health Solutions. And so with that, let's get started. We're really delighted to have um, Alan, Raul, and Roger convened here. Um, and there's just an incredible amount of knowledge that collectively and individually each of you bring to these uh, questions. And so um, one that I'll open with that I hope uh, provides the nature of general discussion that will allow us to drill down is why should CBOs participate um, in this at all? 
uh, and in particular with the social care networks in their geographies. And if any of you wishes to take that first, please go right ahead. So I'm happy to jump in with my limited knowledge. Uh, being old and bald doesn't necessarily make me wise, but uh, first of all, appreciate being here. Appreciate all of you uh, joining us. So I, I think having grown up, and by the way, our firm started as a CBO in California way back in the day, the challenge over the years for anyone who's not a medical provider with a CMS number for Medicare, right, or, or Medicaid number is that uh, funding has been grants and donations and, you know, you're trying to meet community needs. It's very hard to plan. It's very hard to think of yourself sometimes as professional because you're just so busy running around all the time trying to plug holes, deal with people who have fallen through the cracks in society, uh, you know, or, or even consistently need help that you know of in your community and, and raising money, right, is a huge driver versus being able to necessarily be a strategic. Obviously, there are different size CBOs, right, in different situations, but in terms of why should you contract, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, but it's very clear since the Accountable Care Act, there's been this progression to move more and more healthcare services into a value-based premium, a value-based payment model so that, so that there's an incentive to reduce the total cost of care versus just providing lots of expensive surgery. How do CBOs fit into this? People have started to realize through research and you know, looking at, at, at data and members that not all of the drivers of expense, what we call medical loss ratio, are medical. A lot of these drivers are things that we would not think of as medical, like I can't get food. I'm uh, in a violent relationship and until someone helps me get out of it, I can't really think about my health care. Uh, you know, my children are, are sick and I don't have a way to take care of them and get them into the doctor. Uh, I'm pregnant and I can't get the perinatal appointments because I have no transportation. So what has happened is that the feds and the states um, and to an extent even employers have started to recognize that if they can provide evidence-based non-medical services to people in a consistent manner with service level uh, excellence that's consistent so we know what we're providing, then we can actually improve care outcomes and reduce the total cost of care. And so that's what you all as CBOs have the opportunity to do. Well, how do you, you can't do it unless you contract, right? So you, and in New York state, the opportunity is to contract generally with an SCN first. Over time, it might be the health plans that take some of this on either with the SCNs, um, there might be consolidation. But I would say as, as CBOs, it's important for you to contract with the SCN, think about what services you wanna provide, think about what you need to be paid to be sustainable. And it's a really an opportunity to change your business model so that you might have some, at least some areas where you have very sustainable revenue from Medi-Cal and you're able to prove and show that what you do for people, it really reduces the total cost of care. They're being hospitalized less, using the ED less, et cetera. So stop there, um, that's my initial thought. Thank you very much, Alan. Roger, it looked like you had a thought that you wanted to jump in with, please. Yeah, and, and I thought I would flip off, uh, flip flip around the question, question and, 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 uh, and, and moving off what Stephen said, there's a diminishing supply of funds that are not linked to some kind of um, outcome or value proposition. So part of the opportunity is funds that allow for a CBO to make a certain demonstration of, of the value of non-traditional services towards that um, the health related goals. But you know what we've been seeing over time is uh, what have been traditional sort of infrastructure monies flowing into a variety of um, special needs populations. Those have been diminishing over time, the government support and philanthropic support as well. So a greater percentage of the kind of funds that are out there are carrying these sorts of demands. So part of the answer in my mind of the question of why participate is increasingly you don't have a choice to not participate. Um, and so that's something that I think uh, where there's an opportunity uh, to explore that and to know that that's generally speaking where funds are flowing these days, you kind of have to. That's a very helpful point, Roger. Um, Raul, is there anything that you would wish to add? No, I think this is a 
you know, brand new program. We're seeing how it's rolling out in California, Oregon, and state of Washington, which is great. So they're ahead of the game. And that's why, you know, we invited Coke to provide this uh, outline because they're uh, deeply involved in that process. Uh, one of the things back, you know, just uh, hearkening on what uh, Roger just mentioned is when I was with the state, uh, we had situations where a Medicaid recipient would need a, an air conditioner for health related reasons uh, or would need a nightlight for health re related uh, reasons. Uh, now, we didn't have a provider code for that, um, but they still got what they needed only after they brought a lawsuit, however. So that, so that was the hidden warranty, I, I recall asking, I was on the reimbursement and fraud side, uh, and uh, my colleagues were on the me uh, Medicaid coverage side in, in the attorney group, uh, and they would authorize, you know, air conditioners, night lights, a variety of things that would come up. Um, and I said, well, where's the provider code to bill for that? He says, there is no provider code. It's necessary for, you know, for the health related needs of the Medicaid recipient in question, they proved it by litigating. And the, you know that's called a hidden warranty. So you know this is great you know, in my mind that we've started down this path. Uh, and I think what you'll see uh, you know, with regard to the health-related social needs, and that's why they call it health-related social needs. Um, you know, all of these items, new procedure codes that are gonna be rolled out you know, as part of the 1115 waiver here in New York, uh, New York health equity um, uh, aspect of the waiver, similar to California, similar to Oregon, similar to um, the state of Washington, is the connectivity to your healthcare well-being. And I think that's going to be a critical aspect as you look at screening, the provision of services, eligibility. You know, we're only looking at a set number of um, uh, micro the cosms of our Medicaid population. So eligibility will be a big thing, if you will. Screening will be a big thing. There is a cap on the number of, you know, the amount, both for, you know, the infrastructure and for the, the provision of services. So I'm anticipating that there will be some kind of um, cap on coverage. We have eligibility, then we have coverage. So all of those items are being worked out you know, in the state of New York. Uh, and I think it's fantastic that we have, you know, the California experience to look to because CMS is kind of consolidating a more uniform approach to, you know, this area, you know, uh, over the last three or four years. Uh, and we're seeing kind of a refinement in New York in terms of how these uh, services would be covered uh, and potentially capped, you know, at a certain level. Thank you. That's very helpful. I'm sorry, I was having a little trouble coming off of mute. Um, one of the things that I wanted uh, to have this group discuss is the pace by which these uh, changes will be implemented. Um, I moved through it quickly earlier, but uh, and I alluded to the fact that there was a lot of negotiation as between CMS and uh, New York State, and ultimately approval for uh, the waiver amendment as constructed came in January of 2024. Um, that was, you know, many months after um, it had been uh, rumored or otherwise uh, when uh, the provider community thought that, you know, it might be time to go and as it were to implement this work. Knowing that uh, we are nearing the end of 24 and uh, there are the calendar years of 25 and 26, as well as a short tail in uh, 27, um, what will implementation look like with that compression of time? What might be highlighted versus sublimated, knowing that uh, not everything can get done at once, potentially? I, any... I guess I can jump in briefly. I mean, it's a crystal ball question, right? But I think having been through now, gosh, I don't know how many of these waivers, eight, you know, that some of the initial ones were in California when Clinton got the haircut on, on the runway, right? And we got our big waiver in California. The, these waivers, whether they're in California, Texas, New York, Oregon, Washington, wherever they are, they always go slower than you think. It's a hurry up and wait process if you guys have heard of hurry up and wait. And so I don't know how to answer the question in terms of exactly what's going to happen when. I think what we can 
what we know, here's what we know for certain is going to happen. At some point, all of these services will have been tested out. It'll be clear what gets a return on investment for the MLR. It'll also be clear, honestly, which CBOs can deliver consistently the services that we need to get uh, for our members to reduce medical loss ratios. In other words, admissions, you know, better drug adherence, et cetera. And, and they will be contracted, right? And they'll have to thrive under the rates that they get, um, which will be negotiated just like any provider's rates. Um, there'll be better rates or better payment overall, right? For folks that have a proven outcome. And I think that the extra money, we talk about this in California all the time, right? There's extra money right now, quote unquote, in the waiver, right? A lot in New York, what is it like 3.4 billion or so? California has a whole bunch where basically they're paying for these services outside the premium. So I think what people need to think about is that whether it's in 2027, 2028, 2029, or 2030, fairly soon in, in operational time and the time it takes to transform an organization, all of this work will be paid through contracts like the SCN agreements, either through them or through health plans in every state, or at least most of the states that have had the waivers. And that uh, that will have to fit in the premium. So there won't be this outside the premium money forever, because if you talk to health plan people and states and CMS, the one message that's very clear is there's just not a lot more money. The Obama administration was the first one to start to try to push back against all these waivers and shovelfuls of money going out to the states. So I, I think what we do know is that we need to move quickly to transform our business models and be successful in reducing any avoidable costs we can so we can pay for these services under the premium because whether it takes three years or five years, at some point, uh, this will be inside the premium dollars and there will be no more extra money like there is in this waiver. Roger, you've come off mute. Yeah, have... yeah. And, and part of obviously the crystal ball gazing is um, has something to do with uh, uh, with the federal elections that are coming up and and and, and uh, health care policy choices that might be made uh, differently by by either of the two uh, you know candidates. Um, but I do think that for a CBO that is thinking about entering the space to to whom this is new, uh, you almost need to plan for the end of it at the beginning, right? And the end could be uh, either a demonstration of value, which is the which is the positive, right? and 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 memorialization in in a finished um, uh, in a premium that's received through a plan, or the opposite. Right. And so I think that um, part of the conversation at the CBO level is how do you prepare for both eventualities? Um, and I would say, and, and Stephen, I don't know what your what your thoughts are, but you talk about the demonstration uh, of, uh, of value. It seems very hard to me in the truncated time frame to think that uh, you know, particularly longer term investments that might have, you know, impacts over five or 10 years, uh, Alan, excuse me, uh, that 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 it would be uh, something that uh, can be proven beyond the reasonable doubt in a scientific manner in the time frame given. So what is proof in, in that short time frame? I think is a, it's kind of an interesting question. I don't know if there's something from the California experience that is... Um, revelatory there uh, because I think it will be important to how how those contracts are are structured on the front end. Yeah, no, I, I look, I completely agree with you, right? You can do regression analyses and everything all day long. It's always been hard in healthcare to understand what really does impact the outcome, right? When you've got environmental factors and uh, so many diversities in, in data for relation to people, right? Human beings. What I would say to your point is I do think folks should look at the end in mind I do think that it's critical for every CBO to get a contract in this SCN and learn how to be contracted. And I think to your point, whether or not it's quote unquote proven, all right, is a tough question. But here's what's provable. My CBO provides a service that your members want and you think they need. Let me give you an example, right? Transportation and consistent food, nutrition, right? whether it's medically tailored meals or whether it's simply adequate nutrition to, to maintain health, especially during a space where maybe I'm you know, transitional in my housing situation or I you know, lost my job, my family needs to eat. 
these are things that are, they don't require a whole bunch of proof, right? We know that if we get people transported to visits, they will get the visit. If they don't get transported to the visit, they don't get the visit. And so, uh, and there are other examples, right? Here in Naval education and support, for instance. So what I would say to the CBOs is, you know what you do, you know what you want to do well, what you do well, you know what services you're in. What you need to think about is with, what can you deliver at the right scale and consistently well? Whether or not it's quote unquote proven is a different question than whether or not you can prove the ability to consistently deliver it in the way the plan needs you to, or the SCN needs you to for now, to meet the member's needs. So I would think about that, you know, less than maybe quote unquote proving it, although people will ask you for a lot of data, which you'll have to be ready to have. But I think what you can prove today is you, you can start to prove that you have a service that's valuable that you can deliver consistently at a certain level of quality, because that will go a long way by itself. And that's what we're seeing in California, right? Is the folks that can start to do that are gonna be the ones that get the contracts, right? And start to honestly build market share, which is probably a strange thing for a CBO to think about. But look, you're, the same thing's gonna to happen to you that's happened to FQHCs, which are basically CBOs, right? and everyone else in healthcare that we, we live in the United States of America. It's a for-profit business. It just is lots of it. It's non-profit, but it operates as a business. And so you're going to have to think about market share and competitive position and the ability to deliver and maintain what you do, because of course your mission is to do it and you think you do a great job. So, so prove it by again, being able to scale and be consistent in those services and listen to your payer, the FCN, when they tell you what their members need. Thank you, Alan. And so let me move on to one further question. Um, and it's an amalgamation of a few that we've received. Um, essentially, there are queries around how historically marginalized populations will be uplifted through this waiver. Um, and you know, that marginalization uh, could be, for instance, um, you know, individuals who are, uh, you know, using American or who rely on American Sign Language to communicate. Um, they're individuals um, living with developmental differences. Um, and, you know, when you think about those uh, as just examples, and you connect that to the list of the uh, target populations for enhanced services, um, knowing what we know about California, is every need going to get met? or are there some populations that will be more so or less so the focus of all of this? I'll just very briefly say that one of the things I've seen happen in California that's really exciting is, and it's a real problem in New York, right? So African-American women who become pregnant having healthy babies, it's a, it's a massive problem to the point where we should all be embarrassed, right? Particularly in New York, uh, everywhere in the country, but particularly in New York. And uh, what we've seen is that there's a, a woman actually, her name is Ethiopia. She's a African-American immigrant to this country, um, I believe from the Caribbean. And she's passionate about doulas and passionate about helping black women have healthier births. And she has committed to growing her nonprofit company and a for-profit software adjunct uh, to provide doulas that are culturally sensitive and aligned with, with uh, those women. And, and that is an example of a marginalized population. I know it might not be the ones everyone's thinking of, but to me, that that's what these kinds of things can do, is if you jump in like she did and get all excited and contract and ask for infrastructure funding for the right types of things you can prove you're going to be able to scale. And I can see her day by day growing the opportunity for these women who traditionally have very high risk and bad outcome pregnancies to get that early access to the right type of support they need to have healthier babies. Thank you. That's a really good example, Alan, of uh, you know what may be analogously possible here in New York State as we roll this out. Um, one of the other questions I'll pose is around readiness. Um, you know, we know that um, there are organizations listening in right now that are hearing, um, you know, what this waiver and its implementation is intended to comprise anyway, um, and you know wondering, as Alan, you were alluding to, you know, a process of working in spaces that are other than this to get the job done for their constituents, um, knowing that, again, there is a, a limited amount of time here in New York, what's the best way to be ready and to uh, endeavor to be participatory? 
And it's a question to all three. I think you have to be in the room. You know, as I say, you, you want to be in the room where it happens. So I think one of the issues with DISRIP is some, you know, organization said, we're out. You know, we're really not going to benefit from DISRIP uh, directly. But there were a lot of indirect benefits to participating and being in the room, you know, for the discussion and seeing the development. Uh, so in order to make a knowledgeable decision, uh, I think that all CBOs and other organizations that are going to be involved in this process really need to know uh, the, the inner workings. And I know that one of the big issues is having represented, represented a lot of CBOs in the last you know, 35 years myself, uh, often you would have cost-based contracts uh, and any deficits at the end of the year would be made up by the, either the municipality or by the state traditionally. Uh, and it's a easy way to budget because it's in line with your financial statements in terms of cost. Um, and as it was, it was indicated earlier, we're into a market you know, field uh, where it's a fee for service world and you're really not gonna know what your revenue is gonna be you know, over the year until, you know, as you're monitoring it on a quarterly basis based on referrals, based on actual fee for service. So depending on the scale that you have, you may be above cost or below cost. Uh, and that is a huge, you know, difference, you know, for CBOs that may be work used to donations, grants, uh, and, um, you know, just a completely different way of reimbursement. Um, so that's going to be the, a big hurdle, you know, for organizations coming in. You, but you need, re really need to be aware of it because it could be a great benefit. Um, now, because you you may be getting additional revenues that will support your overall organization uh, in the long run. Uh, and I've spoken to many, you know, uh, uh, organizations that said, you know what, we weren't involved in district because we refused. We had many other things to be <laughs> concerned about. Uh, and those that were involved got ahead of the game, even though they didn't get, you know, the revenue during that period, but they forged relationships and alliances that really helped them, you know, in the future. And I think that's, you know, a key consideration. And if, if I could just pivot off what Raul said, which is to say that being in the room and then subsequently making a decision to either individually or collectively. And I think that's important to say that, you know, a lot of CBOs can participate in these arrangements in, in collective arrangements, gets to the point of building the relationships that may endure beyond the narrow time frame of the 1115. So it can really get you to a point where um, there's a material benefit in the short term, but there's a longer term benefit in terms of um, you know, being able to demonstrate your value. So I think that, you know, I think there's a connectivity there that that allows for people to kind of have a business model beyond. Thank you, um, Roger and Raul. Um, Steven, I think you had a question to pose. Please go right ahead. Yes, um, I'll ask one that I think we got it through the pre-registration process, which is around um, kind of the funding number or amount or kind of our understanding of what funding support and financial support is available to um, nonprofits and other community-based organizations through the waiver. So um, I guess I'll, I'll pose it to, you know, all three of the panelists, which is kind of what is our understanding of, um, you know, how much money is available and steps that uh, CBOs need to take to kind of per, deliver services and access those funds. I think, you know, budgets include capacity building. There, you know, there were some slides that uh, uh, New York State DOH rolled out in terms of, you know, readiness. So, you know, and I've heard a lot about readiness out West in terms of, and, you know, if you really do a deep dive and listen to, uh, you know, the Oregon and, state of Washington, California, you'll hear about information technology and HIPAA and, you know, what goes with fee-for-service and being a provider of care to Medicaid recipients is HIPAA and potentially part two as well. Uh, and if you're interacting with, you know, uh, substance abuse disorder uh, agencies that are within the part two framework, 
there are a host of um, uh, um, capacities and, and skills sets and knowledge that you need to have that you didn't need to have before as a CBO. And so what's part in, in within I, you know, the infrastructure is readiness for the CBOs and other participants to participate, participate in the program. The platform itself, you have care coordination. Um, CBOs do care coordination. They, that's why they're involved and mandated to be involved in this program because they are considered to be the closest to the Medicaid recipients in terms of human beings uh, in need of care beyond you know, the traditional healthcare uh, resources. So the, the objective here is to marry up, you know, that type of, uh, I hate to say boots on the ground, but people that are closest to the Medicaid recipients from a humanistic perspective, not just a healthcare perspective, uh, and then the healthcare needs and how to avoid a situation of repeated hospitalizations or a track of, um, uh, you know, a potential failures with regard to clinical care that could be avoided when you marry up those two concepts. So there is money, you know, that's available and we'll see what that looks like as it's being implemented. In many ways, we are sowing, you know, the field. We've not yet put the, you know, the seeds into the field. Um, in, we in New York, uh, in terms of contracting with MCOs and having, you know, the hubs and the SCN leads, uh, 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 have a, you know, a robust and flexible contract with managed care organizations, which are the intermediary in terms of funding and are very much involved in, you know, this, hopefully a very collaborative process. Uh, then engaging, you know, CBOs and other organizations um, that will actually do the work uh, and contracting with those organizations. Part of that will be uh, uh, capacity building. So it is it is doable. We've seen it done. Um, and I think it just takes a lot of commitment uh, and focus and discipline, along with some funding, of course. <laughs> hey, well, I really agree with your boots on the ground concept. You know, somebody had also asked about enhanced care management, which our firm does a ton of in California. Um, and the health plans have actually, many of them have terminated all their agreements with anybody who does telephonic care management because it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the people we're trying to reach. They're not just going to get on their cell phone and get on an app and, and solve this. They need someone in front of them, like many of us do, to be honest with you. I mean, it's just called humanity, right? Just having someone there. But, you know, they may not have a phone. They may, they may need more than they can get through an app. They may not be capable of using an app, whether they're elderly or have behavioral health uh, issues or simply can't afford the smartphone. Um, so I do think your boots on the ground is correct. And I, I look, I think from a CBO perspective, again, and you've heard this from a few of us now, right? So either we're all uh, right or we're just singing the same wrong tune. I, I, I think we're more uh, right, which is that you have to change your business model. And, and again, I tell you this as someone who now runs uh, an entity that is for profit, but I ran a CBO. That's what we were. We were a CBO in the community. And I know what it's like to go grant to grant. I know what it's like to get a grant and have to deal with all the BS the grant asks of you. And by the time you're done dealing with all the stuff they want, you can barely get the work done that you wrote the grant for in the first place. And I don't get started on donations, right? Unless you're a big hospital or the American Heart Association. So it's very hard, right? Uh, and so now you've got this opportunity to get paid to deliver the services you want to deliver. Think about that for a minute. You don't have to go write a grant. You don't have to go ask someone whether they're willing to donate to you versus the art museum. You can now say, I have this service that I know my community needs. These people need it. They need it this often. They need this much of it. And I can do it. Give me a contract. Here's how much money I need. And what I would urge you all to do, there's data out there. We can certainly help share it with you. There, the rates are not top secret, what they would potentially look like. There's a bunch of published rates for a lot of these services. On the infrastructure side, we don't know how much each SCN is going to give people for infrastructure, but what we're encouraging people to do now is take a look at your finances and your services and start to think about if I could get $100,000, if I could get $50,000, if I could get you know some amount of money, what do I need to expand my services, to deliver them more consistently, to cover more people, to prevent hospitalizations and expensive costs by doing that? Um, I, I think that you do need to start now planning what your ask is gonna be and how you think you're gonna get funded. And again, the good news is there's a lot of information out there 
that can help you get started. You don't have to wait for the state to get all their regulations done. By the time they get everything done, it'll be hurry up and wait. You want to have already done some pre-planning because when they start to release all this stuff, it'll be a big rush to get it on the market as quick as they can. And you don't want to be at that point trying to figure this stuff out. Alan, thank you. That's, I think, a very instructive point uh, that perhaps we'll leave on because we are at the top of the hour. This has been a really terrific panel discussion, and we're hopeful that um, those who are listening have really taken from today what we intend. It's an opportunity to learn about the 1115 waiver, what we can say is potentially ahead in New York State, but with a knowledge base that is born from experience um, in relating programs, uh, including uh, Cope Health Solutions experience in California specifically. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with any of the presenters or others who um, were participatory in creating today's content, um, our email addresses are listed on this slide. Let me remind all of you that you will be getting the slide deck and the recording of today's presentation to you in your inboxes. So please look for those and please treat this as the beginning. We want to be as uh, two organizations uh, supportive of you, instructive to you, um, and otherwise guides during uh, what is a very exciting uh, set of opportunities, uh, but ones we also understand uh, bring a level of complexity that may be new for some organizations, yet we are, you know, certainly as, uh, you know, Cope Health Solutions and Bond, you know, very prepared to give you guidance that um, advances this work. So um, all of that, um, Please, we ask you to take back to your desks and take back to uh, you know your rooms at your offices where you'll be talking about this some more with any luck. And uh, we are here to be of support to you. In the meanwhile, let me wish all of you a terrific day ahead. And we thank you very much for spending this hour with us.